Well, good morning. What a wonderful opportunity we have to bring praise and adoration to our great God and King, and we welcome you in order to do that. Let me say a special welcome to those who may be visiting with us. We're so glad that you're here. There's a little visitor's card there in the pew rack in front of you. If you'll fill that out, that just helps us as we seek to minister to you. But we trust that you will come and encounter Almighty God in a very special day, a special way in this day of worship. Let me say by way of announcement that we are in the midst of the baby bottle boomerang. And, of course, we participated in this for many years. Our local crisis pregnancy center that we support uh, has a, a fundraising opportunity by way of these baby bottles. And the idea is that they go to your house and they're filled with change or bills or uh, with checks. And then they boomerang back and we get those to CPC and... Uh, they are enabled to raise a significant amount of money each year through that. So we hope that you'll take one there outside each of the doors um, as you go out um, this morning. And then by way of prayer, I hope that you'll be praying for some of the upcoming youth events. The youth will be going to uh, Myrtle Beach this weekend, the middle school, and uh, we want to be in prayer for them. And then a couple of things that are coming up in the summer. You say, wow, that just seems so far away. It was 27 degrees this morning. Why are we praying for things this summer? Well, uh, June will come very quickly. Um, June the 13th begins our Vacation Bible School. I want you to be thinking about that and praying about that and that the gospel would go forth in power and that we would see young lives changed uh, through the Lord Jesus. That's June the 13th. And then June the 25th begins our uh, mission trip for our youth as they go to the Bahamas. You've been hearing about that, and I'm sure you'll hear more and more about it as well. But be uh, praying for those um, opportunities of service and ministry as well. Then I want you to continue to pray for the Newmans and the passing of Miss Betty. We want to pray for their encouragement and strength. Um, also for Robert Cogdell, who was in the hospital last weekend with a, a mild heart attack, and he has recovered from that, is at home, and we praise the Lord for uh, the Lord's watching over him. And then Liz White, as she conti continues to battle these kidney issues, and we've been praying for Joy Galloway and Ann Miller and Lewis Harrison as well. Hope that you'll remember them. And then Jack McClure is having surgery this Wednesday. He's going to have his knee operated on and want you to hold him before uh, the Lord as well. And then tonight, I, I want to invite you back tonight. Uh, we do have a very special missionary presentation. We've supported Jumpstart Ministries for a long, long time. And uh, Jumpstart is helping men and women who were formerly incarcerated. And God has drawn them to himself and saved them. These folks have been heavily vetted. 
and uh, they enter into the Jump Start program that helps them transition uh, back into uh, the regular world. And uh, they are very effective uh, in what they do. And I want you to hear what God is doing. It is an amazing work. And uh, they report to us uh, from time to time, and tonight is that opportunity. So I want to invite you back. I know that that will be a great blessing to you as you hear what the Lord is doing. And then I want you to note that our last hymn today is probably going to be new. It's the power of the cross. It was new to me until we sang it at Presbytery just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Jim and Marshall and uh, myself and Josh were able to hear it and sing it. We were struck by it. And so I, I hope that when it comes along uh, that you'll open your lungs and your mouth and sing to the glory of our great God. Well, with those announcements made, let me call us to worship. We, we've crossed the threshold uh, in, and we've left the common and we've come to that which is special. It's holy. And the Lord has deigned to meet with us as we come and we sing his praises and uh, exalt his most holy name. Psalm 70 verse 4 says this, Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. That's what we want to do today. Let's pray together. Father, we know we cannot make you look larger than you are. But when we read of this exhortation to magnify you, we understand it to mean to make you appear as you actually are in all of your glory. And so, Father, we recognize that we can't be those who will be sitting back, who, who will be distracted and thinking about things that need to happen next week or things that happened last week, but that we must be completely given to you and, and thinking your thoughts after you and, and, and considering your wonder and your majesty and your grandeur and your kindness and your love. Lord, this is Mount Calvary Church. We miss some of our folk, but those of us who have gathered here today, we are ready to exalt you because we have thought about all that you are and all that you have done for us, especially in the saving of our souls. And so would you work in a mighty way. Oh God, we come with our hearts filled with gratitude. We're amazed at all of the answered prayer that we have experienced even over the last week. And we praise you for it. Father, we thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit. We thank you for your sovereignty and how you sovereignly orchestrate all of the events in our lives. And you're working all things together for good. But Father, we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, please stand now as we sing together, Rejoice the Lord is King.
This morning we get to, again, affirm our faith, um, come together um, and proclaim what it is that we believe about who Jesus is as our Christ and who he is as uh, the ultimate prophet who has come. So we're going to affirm our faith from Westminster Larger Catechism, uh, question and answer 42 and 43. First, why was our mediator called Christ? How doth Christ execute the office of a prophet? Christ executed the office of a prophet in his revealing to the church in all ages by the Spirit and Word in God's ways of administration, the whole will of God in all things concerning their edification and salvation. I, I trust and um, thank the Lord that we were able to give to the Lord um, of our tithes and offerings. I wanted to read from Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25, uh, speaking of how it is that we give. Proverbs 11, verse 24 and 25 says, There is one who scatters, in other translations say, uh, gives freely. There's one who scatters, yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than what is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. This uh, proverb speaks of, as we give generously, we become rich. As we bless and as we water, we ourselves will be watered. And that's the promise from God. Not financial, uh, not material blessings, uh, but spiritual blessings. Uh, that God wants to bless you. Uh, God has designed this world in such a way that as you give, and as you love, and as you water, that you will be blessed. As it is uh, out of love for him, and for his honor, and for his glory. So that's what we trust. Uh, that as we give, as we give up, as we, as we give up maybe the American dream and say, no, I'm going to give, I'm going to be generous, then we receive the blessings uh, that God has for us. Let us sing the doxology. God, we thank you so much for all the good blessings that you've given us. Lord, you are so full of beauty and joy and happiness and good things, Lord, and you um, just delight to give us good things in abundance. We praise you and we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we thank you especially for this, your son, Jesus Christ, who came to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, now we um, have the privilege to give back just a little bit. So Lord, we pray that we would do that with humility with joy, with purpose.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning and we praise you for who you are. And Lord, we do ask that you would work in our hearts. That you would create in us a clean heart. That you would take away all of our sins. That you would blot out our transgressions. That you would cleanse us. We pray, Lord, and acknowledge that we are sinners. That we need the blood of your Son to cleanse us and to make us whole. To bring us back into a relationship with you. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sins from this past week. Lord, we are sinners and we sin every day, every hour. Lord, by what we do and by what we fail to do. Lord, we are poor and needy. We pray that you would help us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who came to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, he died so that for all who will confess their sins, who will acknowledge that they are broken, Lord, who will come with a broken and contrite heart, Lord, you forgive us. And we thank you for that promise. Lord, we thank you that you hear, that you grant forgiveness, especially, Lord, only as we come in the name of your Son. But Lord, we also pray that you would make us more and more like you. Lord, we know that we will always have to confess our sins. Lord, that we always have to come back to you in repentance. But Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would renew a right spirit within us. Help us to be re, um, restored to the joy of your salvation. Help us to flee our sins, to live in holiness and righteousness. Lord, continue to, work, to do a work in our heart. Continue to bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we, help, we pray that you would help us to know you and to love you more and more. Help us to seek you. Help us to follow after you. Help us to run in paths of righteousness. Help us to love your word, prayer, fellowship, service, evangelism. Lord, we pray that you would please give us grace to live ever more for you. Not for ourselves, not for the things of this world, but for you. Lord, we beg that you would do this in us. Lord, we also pray for the physical needs of this body. Lord, we pray for the Newman family this morning. Lord, Miss, Be Miss Betsy was such a blessing to this church, to her family, and to this community. We thank you so much for the work that you did through her. Lord, we praise you for her. And Lord, we thank you so much that she is now made whole, that she's no longer affected by sin, that she's with you. Lord, what an amazing hope and confidence we can have. And yet, Lord, we pray for this body and for her daughters especially, Lord. This is such a hard time. Lord, we pray that you would comfort them and bless them, that you'd watch over them and be very close to them. Lord, we also pray for Jack McClure as he has knee surgery this, week, this Wednesday. Please be with him. Please give the doctors wisdom and precision and help him as, re as he recovers, Lord. Just give him a peace and a comfort, Lord, and be near to him. Lord, we pray for Kim Biggerstaff as she continues to fight with covid Pray for Liz White as her, in her need for another procedure for her kidney stones. Pray for Joy Galloway, Lord, as she needs you, Lord, in a, in a special way. We pray for Lewis Harrison, for Robert Cogdill, and for Emily Rhodes. Lord, we need you every hour. We are weak, we are needy, we are broken, and yet you are our God, and you are our shepherd. We come to you and we pray that you would comfort and guide these dear brothers and sisters. Lord, please be with this body in a special way. We pray so in Jesus' name. Amen. Three and four-year-olds may be dismissed for children's church now. Please stand as we sing together. Uh, wonderful, merciful Savior.
Join me at John chapter 7. Hope that you have your Bible this morning or a device by which you can read God's holy and inspired and inerrant word. But we want to look at John chapter 7 this morning. And I want to begin reading at verse 14. And read through verse 31. Verse 14 through 31 of John chapter 7. This is the word of the Lord. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. And he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marveled. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes... Will he do more signs than these which this man has done? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we commit this time to you and ask that you would be our teacher. You know what we need to hear. You know what each heart, each life needs. And Lord, I pray that you'd give it. Give clarity. Give a readiness to receive from your hand. And conform us to the image of Christ, for we pray in his name. Amen. This has been an interesting week. Well, let me back up. What do you think was on the heart and mind of the Lord Jesus as he was going to Jerusalem this time here in John chapter 7? What do you think was going through his mind? I think sometimes we come to passages of scripture like this and we say, wow, it's so technical. This message is not mine, but it comes from him who sent me and... Those who will to do my Father's will, they're the ones who are going to get this. And, and then dealing with the law and came from Moses and yet you do not keep it. And you're just kind of thinking, what, what was going on? What was he doing? Realize that our Savior is the most brilliant man who would ever walk and knows exactly what the people of Jerusalem would need at that moment would know that the Holy Spirit would record these words for us and what we need century after century, including to our day. And he is giving exactly what they needed and what you need as well. Back to this week. You know, this week, I have heard of devastating stories of sin in people's lives. One one of our members, co-workers, Didn't show up for work for several days. Finally checked on the situation. And it appears like what happened in that home 
was a murder-suicide at the hands of our member's co-worker. Um, I heard a story this week of, of, a, of an adult child being really rough on a parent, almost abusive on a parent. Um, I just think of my own life and my own sins. The, the things we struggle with. And you think about what was in the heart and mind of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, you better believe he's the mediator of the covenant. And he's the prophet. He's the one who reveals his will and what's necessary for for you in this moment to live life, not, not only for the saving of your soul, but for the living of life moment by moment. This stuff is important. You know, our habit is to come to worship. I hope your habit is to come twice on Sunday to get as much preaching as you possibly can. Why? So that we can deal with the sinfulness of our own hearts and the sin in our world as well. You know, when we come to John chapter 7, in the early part, he's, the, the Holy Spirit has been revealing to us who Jesus is. Um, Jesus' brothers come to him, why don't you go up and, and tell everybody, do all these signs and miracles before everybody, and kind of flex a little bit and show out. Here in the passage that we've read today, it transitions from who Jesus is to what he's teaching. And that's the, the focus Keeping in mind that Jesus is aware of what these people need. He's not, he's not being um, esoteric. He's not, he's not dealing with things that are not really the concerns of the people of his day. He's dealing with exactly what they need. And what he's doing is, is he's putting them in a position to believe the truth that God reveals to, to them. That's what he's doing. And you know what? Not just to them, but to you. He's putting you in a position to be able to embrace the truth that he's teaching. And that's a marvelous thing. That's marvelous teaching. Wouldn't you love to have heard it? Wouldn't you have loved to have heard the whole sermon? The whole teaching. Oh, what an amazing thing to, to be able to hear. To hear that. Well, Many are listening today, you sitting here, those on the internet. And, and my prayer is, is that God will give us clarity and the ability to embrace the truth and to hear it with ears to hear and eyes to see so that we will, in fact, be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, either saved or helped in our walk with him. This stuff is important. Two major points today. Here's the first one. <clears throat> I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus' teaching doesn't come from earth, it doesn't come from him, but it comes from heaven. It comes from his heavenly father, ultimately. It comes from God. And you can say, okay, I, I understand that. That's clear from the text. That's verse 16. My doctrine is not mine, but, he, uh, but he, his who sent me. So what? Well, we're going to talk about so what in this point. Um. <clears throat> Look at verse 15, first of all. If verse 15 had been said to us, I think we would have been inclined to say, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about my teaching. Look what verse 15 says. And the Jews marveled at this teaching, saying, how does this man know letters, or it could be actual letters of the alphabet, or letters as in epistles, or the scriptures, but here the sense is, is the learning. How, how does this man know all this learning? Having never studied, I think a lot of us would have hooked our thumbs inside our suspenders and said, yeah, pretty sharp guy. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Got on top of this. Appreciate you appreciating my teaching. But that's not what the Lord Jesus does. And had he done that, he would have been immediately discredited for uh, taking full credit for what he's saying. Because in this day, what rabbis did when they taught is they merely quoted other people. Nobody had an original thought. They just quoted old rabbis uh, back through the, the, uh, the ages. And so Jesus doesn't say, yeah, this is my teaching. What he did, what he does is he said, no, it's not mine. 
It's the one who sent me. And he's connecting himself with the Father. And that's important for these people to be able to grasp the truth. I'm not speaking on my own accord. I got this from the Heavenly Father. The source is not the rabbis. The source is not even human. But it's God's as well. And you may be sitting there and saying, okay, so <laughs> what difference does that make? I'm glad that that's the case. I'm glad that uh, this truth comes from our Heavenly Father. But what difference does that ultimately make for me? Well, I want to make this point that the teaching as understood by man as compared with teaching that comes from God are two completely different things. They're not even a variation on a theme. They're they're typically diametrically opposed. And so I want to try to make a case for that in the next few moments, okay? I want to talk about maybe four subjects and look at how man typically views those subjects and how God views those subjects. That make sense? Okay, we're talking about the fact, this first point is, is that his teaching didn't come from earth, didn't come from him, didn't come from a human source, but came from the Father. So what? Well, let's look at some of these subjects. First of all, consider the subject of God himself. What does man say about God and what does God say about God? Let's talk about that just for a moment. Usually, as the walk-a-day world thinks about God and speaks of God, he views God too small. But people will say things like, yeah, the big guy upstairs. Or God is my co-pilot. Or God is the ideal in any one of a number of other sort of descriptions of God. But all of those sell God short because none of those understandings of God see him as large enough. They don't, they don't show God to be intimately in control and sovereignly working together all things. It certainly doesn't present God as someone who is holy. Now let's talk about how God views God, how God reveals himself in all of scripture. And what God does is, is he re reveals himself to be eternal. He does reveal himself to be someone who is sovereign over all of his creatures and all of their actions. And he's working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose and those that love him. As well, And as well, it is really clear that God has presented himself as someone who is holy, really holy. Someone in whom there is no unrighteousness at all. That's what the text says here. And so the disparity between the two views, what man says and what God says, uh, is, is a great gulf. As to how we understand who God is. Our great God would be the one who would create all things. And would sustain all things by the power of his will. And, and when he saw mankind fall, he would begin to work redemption's story. To the point that he would send his only begotten son and, and send him to earth to take human flesh. So that he could live one of our lives and do it sinlessly, die on Calvary's cross to atone for all those who would believe so that we might save. God is, what God is, who he is, is constantly intruding into our lives with grace, with supernatural power to make a difference in um, our lives. That's who God is. That's a difference, isn't there? <laughs> That's a big difference. Well, that's the subject of God. Well, let's talk about another subject where there's a disparity between the view of man and the view of God. Let's talk about the view of Scripture. If we could be kind about it, how the world often sees the Scriptures is a record of man seeking after God. Or even a record of man's views of God. There are a lot of other things that are a whole lot worse that are said about the scriptures. But that, I think that's a kind rendering of oftentimes what the world sees in the Bible. But God, God reveals himself in his word um, 
and, and he reveals his view of the word as something that is completely different. Not, not as a record of man seeking after God, but can't we clearly see that what the scriptures provide for us is a record of God seeking us? <laughs> it's the exact opposite. And what a glorious seeking that has been. It, it reveals, scripture does, the fact that God requires perfect obedience on our part and that man has failed in that and is a sinner and is separated from God by that sin. And so what God does is he spends the balance of scripture describing redemption story. You, you know, we've, we've said it many times that the, the very quick outline of scripture is creation, fall, redemption. We've heard that a million times. Creation, fall, redemption. You know how many chapters we have in creation? Two. You know how many chapters we have in the fall? One. You know what the rest of the Bible is about? <laughs> it's about redemption. And you start with those skins that God placed on Adam and Eve. And you, you walk through all of the sacrifices. And you walk through uh, the, the Day of Atonement. And you walk through the tabernacle. And you walk through the temple. And you walk through God trying to call his people back from sin throughout the prophetic books. And you walk through the gospels and the presentation of who Jesus is. And the epistles as God is working out the story of redemption in actual local churches, and what you find is, is redemption. <laughs> redemption. Creation, fall, redemption. That's a little bit different than saying that the Bible is a record of man seeking after God. Let me give you another third subject here. Well, let me back up just a minute. Let me back up before we move on to a third subject. Let's, let's talk about it. Still this view of scripture. So that, that leaves us with a question to be asked, doesn't it? Because some of you are not convinced that the scriptures are really divine. Some of you are, and that's great. That, that is necessary. That is essential. But some of you are saying, I don't know, good book, well written, high standard. I'm going to respect it. But divine, mm, I don't know about that. Or inspired or inerrant. Pastor, I hear you say that all the time. I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to go that far. Well, if it is those things, it is our only foundation for living. It's what you have to build your spiritual house with. And if we build our spiritual understanding on anything else, it's like building a house on a foundation of a swamp. That house is going to settle, and ultimately it's going to fall in. You know, we, we, we back up and we, we, we do things with regard to religion, and we say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be super energetic about this religion and super sincere and that's what I'm going to depend on. Energy and sincerity. And it's not going to work out. The story is told about uh, right after World War II, there were tons, there was a housing boom, and lots of houses were being built, and the houses were not being built very well. They were being thrown up. There was a couple who uh, purchased one of these houses. They were so excited just to have a house. And... Um, they moved in, first night was a really chilly night, and, and, and they were really excited about the house because they had a fireplace in it. Chilly night, and so they said, well, let's, let's start a fire. And so they did, and they're sitting before the glow of this wonderful wood fire there, and it's casting the, the uh, orange glow throughout the whole den. And then all of a sudden, the whole fire in the fireplace went out of sight. It dropped, it dropped through the floor, dropped down to the basement. And what had happened was, is that the builder had not put anything on the bottom of the fireplace that actually would hold a fire. It was just subflooring. And they didn't realize it. So the fire burned, caught the subflooring on fire. You know, it just looked like fire. And it burned a hole right in the floor. Bam! The whole fire ended up in the basement. And that's kind of like what it is when we build a spiritual house uh, on something that can't be trusted. <laughs> Your sincerity is not going to be enough. Your energy with regard to your interactions with what you believe to be God is not enough. It must be founded upon God 
himself as he reveals himself in Holy Scripture. Well, let me give you a, a third subject. We talked about man and God's view of God and of Scripture. And then thirdly, I want you to think about man's view and God's view of man. What does the world say about man? Well, it says, um, what the world says is, is that man is pretty good. Um, most people in the world would say, I think I'm better than most, and God would be thrilled to have me. But you know what? That's like understanding that the world is filled with sinners, and I'm just the best sinner. I'm a sinner, but I'm the best one. And what does God's word say? Well, there's none righteous. There's none that does good. There's none that seeks after God. That we've all sinned and come short of this glory of God, this standard that he has raised up. But you know, if you have a difficulty seeing your own sinfulness, and we all do, we all have a, a, a difficult time of, of standing apart from ourselves and looking back at ourselves and accurately assessing ourselves. We have a hard time doing that accurately. And you know, if, if that is the case, then what we have to do is we have to under, understand ourselves, not by cons comparing ourselves to others, but by measuring ourselves by the measuring stick of God's word. of the law. Because what we do is, is we do what Jesus was addressing in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember what happened there? You know, the Pharisees were saying, well, I've never killed anybody. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, that's a good thing. But you know, you think you've kept the law if you've not actually killed anybody, but if you, if you have anger in your heart, if you say, and this was the Lord's word, raka, if you say, you fool, then you violated the command, thou shalt not kill. What? Whoa, 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 you can't do that. And what we do is we're trying to compress the application of the law to where we can live with it and we're not caught on the horns of that. Same thing with sexual sin. I, I'm not committed adultery and the Lord Jesus says, look, if you've looked upon a woman to lust in your heart, then you violated that commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And what we try to do is compress, and what the Lord is doing is making the broadest application that the Scripture allows. And it's God's Word that exposes us. And you know, do we, do we have the courage to, to lay our lives before the Scriptures in order to get an accurate read on us? I think a lot of times we just don't have that courage. And what we say is, is that the word is, is not divine. And I'm not, I'm not measuring myself by that. I'm measuring myself by my own measuring stick. Well, guys, if, if I measure myself by my own measuring stick, I'd say I'm seven feet tall. <laughs> you with me? Story is told about a police officer that stopped a car in San Francisco. He stopped the car, he ran the plates, and uh, <clears throat> it turns out that the car is not even registered. In fact, he ran the plates and it had 59 parking tickets against it. And so, dug up the owner, and the owner was Joseph Aliato. Now, at this particular time, this is the early 1970s, Joseph Aliato was the mayor of San Francisco, and this was his son driving the car. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the police officer does his job. Mayor Aliato finally gets word of this, and when he gets word that he has a son driving the car, it's not even registered, all these parking, unpaid parking tickets, he explodes. In fact, what he does is he, he says, I want the records searched. 
I want to know all of my family members who are in this situation. So he finds out there are another eight aliatos <laughs> who have all these tickets against them. And, uh, and they are exposed. He ultimately pays their, their fines. I don't know what else he did with them or to them. But hopefully they, they felt the sting of the mayor's wrath. But you know, it's the word of God that exposes us. And we need that exposure. We need the proper measuring stick to be able to see just exactly who we are. There's one other category. I've got a bunch more here, but I don't have time. Just one more category. I want you to see how the world views and how God views in this category. And that is the person of the Lord Jesus. God, scripture, and now the Lord Jesus. The world as is recorded in the text. We can look back through John chapter 7. Verse 12 says, oh, Jesus is a good man. Verse 12 also said, no, no, he's a deceiver. Verse 40 says, he's a prophet. Verse 20 says, he's a demon. Or he has a demon. Verse 46 says, oh, no one ever spoke like this. So they're all over the map with regard to who the Lord Jesus is. So what does the scripture say about him? It, the scripture says that he is the eternal Son of God, that he has existed forever, that he is very God of very God, and that in time and space he took human flesh and he came to earth and he died an atoning death so that we might be saved. That's who Jesus is. And that he died, he was raised from the dead, and he ascended to heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father right now. That's, who he's, that's what the scripture says that he is. Now, you say, okay, what difference does all of that make? Those four categories in seeing man's view and God's view. What this tells us is, is that God's doctrine and only God's doctrine, only God's view, that's what verse 16 is saying, my doctrine is not, not mine, but is his who sent me. He's saying that only God's doctrine is sufficient for our salvation. In other words, my friends, if you are making up your own religion, if you're saying, I don't know, you know, I think that all you need to do to go to heaven is die because all people go to heaven. If you're making that up and you do not have a foundation of the scriptures, my friends, you are in great danger. You're in great danger. Only God's doctrine is sufficient for salvation. And second of all, I want you to notice that we can be sure of God's doctrine even if we find it strange. We can be sure of it. I want you to see this in verse 17. Verse 17 says this from the lips of our Lord Jesus. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. Look at that first part again. If anyone wills to do his will, in other words, if anybody wants to obey God, he's going to get the doctrine. But the opposite is also true. If you do not want to obey God, you're not going to understand the doctrine. You with me? In other words, if you're, if you're listening today and you're, and you're doubting and you're saying, you know what, nobody's going to tell me what to do. There's not going to be an authority in my life other than me. Then you're never going to grasp this. That's what verse 17 is saying. If a, if a man, a woman, a boy, a girl determines in advance that he will live by this truth, that he is serious with God, then God discloses that truth to him. That's, a, that's an important point and something we've got to hang on to. Now, I said that there were two major points in this sermon. We just completed the first one. And that is that <clears throat> this truth that Jesus is presenting, this marvelous teaching, is not from man, it's not from earth, but it comes from the Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father. Here's the second thing I want you to see, and it's really from verse 21 through 24. Let's look at the text, and then I'm going to give you the point. 
Verse 21, Jesus answered and he said, I did one work. And really what he's referring to is the work he did recorded in John chapter 5 when he heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. And you'll remember that that took place on the Sabbath day. So that's what he's talking about. Look at verse 21 again. I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but it was from the fathers. You'll remember the circumcision actually came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. Moses picked it up and shrined it in the law. So they putting all this emphasis on Moses. Um, and so that's why the uh, parenthetical statement here. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath, which if he, you circumcise on the eighth day, if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath, in order to keep the law, they believe, you, uh, you circumcise on the Sabbath. But notice verse 23. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? I healed the man who was lame. He was waiting for the waters to be moved, for somebody to throw him in the waters there in John chapter 5. And you guys are torqued with me because I made somebody completely well. Don't you see that circumcision on the Sabbath is merely an indication, it's just a picture of the cutting away of sinful flesh. But here I'm making his flesh new. On the Sabbath day, how can you have a problem with that? Verse 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteousness. Now, let me make a, a point. Here's the second major point, and, and it's this, is that the law here is being used to drive us to Jesus. The law here is being used to drive us to Jesus, and that's what the law is all about. What they were doing is, is they were saying, no, 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 the law is something by which we get clean. The law is something by which we get saved, hence all this uh, uh, focus and importance being laid on it. <clears throat> you see, the law is like a mirror, and what we do is we see ourselves in the mirror of the law. And seeing that we come up short or that we are dirty, it drives us to a Savior. And that was the intention of the law throughout uh, it, it, its existence and its force. You know, we look at ourselves in a mirror and we see that we're dirty and we should run to Jesus. What they were doing is looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, whoa, I need to get clean. Let me see if I can clean myself with a mirror. Anybody ever tried to clean the dirt off their face with a mirror? Well, no, that's ridiculous. Nobody's done that. But that's what they were doing. Oh, you keep the law and you get clean. No. No, you don't. It was the, the end of the 12th century, and Scotland and England were at war. And <clears throat> the English were on the heels of Scotland's king. Scotland's king in the end of the 12th century was Robert the Bruce. And they were chasing him down, and he was on the run. And they were nipping at his heels, and... He's moving down the road and he's saying, I'm not putting any more distance between myself and the pursuing English soldiers. And so he gets off the road and dives down into this very deep, thick forest. And he's making his way through the forest and he's thinking, things are, things are getting better. They sound like they're, they're further away. And then he hears a sound that just crushes him. He hears the baying of hounds. And not just any hounds, but he can tell they're his hounds. And what the English soldiers had done is they had, they had gotten his hounds, captured them, said, hey, put him on, they put them on the scent of their own master. And they're like, hey, it's great. Let me go see my master, as dogs often do. And so dogs that were supposed to protect him and serve him are now being used to track him down. He said, well, it's all over. And he had run and run and run. He was exhausted. And finally, he says, you know, unless I'm able to put something between me and these dogs, I'm done. They're going to catch me uh, within a few minutes. And about that time, he comes over a rise, and he comes to a swiftly move, moving stream. And it was big enough that he could get in. And he got in it immediately, jumped right in, and the stream very quickly swept him downstream. And he, he just stayed in the stream and floated and was swept very quickly for about a mile. And finally, after a mile or so, he gets out on the other side of the stream, and he hides. 
and he listens. And he can hear these hounds coming towards where he had gone into the stream, and then they stop. They're flummoxed. They don't know what to do. They're, they're stuck because they've lost the scent. And you know, that's a great picture of the law in the Lord Jesus Christ because what the law does, the law is good. And what the law does is it drives us and it shows us our great need. But the great need of Robert the Bruce and our great need is to take a plunge into something that can rid us of the scent of sin. We need to take that plunge. A plunge into Jesus Christ. And so that's the question for us, is have you done that? Have you come to the Lord? Because that's the only thing that can rid you of your sin. It's not the keeping of the law. It's not your religiousness. It's not your energetic following of, of some sort of religious rite. It's not church membership or baptism. It's only Jesus. It's only the blood of Jesus that can wash you. And you know what? The only thing that can strengthen and bless you to be able to live a life where we don't do the things that I described at the outset of this message, where people are taking other people's lives and taking their own life, where people are abusing others, where we're just fighting our own personal sin, our gossip, our anger, our lust, all of those things. It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. And so the question is, is have you plunged into him immediately and without reservation said, Jesus is the one who can help me. Jesus has this very technical presentation in John chapter 7, which you can bet on his mind is you. And your battles, your need for him, your need for a savior, your need for a Savior who, who is with you every day and pours out grace upon you. The question is, is will you have him? Or will you have a view like these that we've described, man's view of God and of Scripture and of the Lord Jesus himself? Will you have him? Will you be saved? Will you take that plunge? Let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you for this snapshot of our Savior's life. Lord Jesus, we, we long for you to come after us. We need you. Help us to realize that. Lord, don't let us miss um, days of being in your word and being in prayer. Lord, don't let us miss weeks of worship. Help us to realize the power of the means of grace as we fight our own sin and our own struggle. But Father, for my friends who may be listening over the internet, who may be here today, I pray for them, any who don't know you in a saving way. Father, I pray that you would, you would make it clear to them that they have been running and they have been hounded by uh, the law and by this incredible standard. But there is relief for them if they'll simply plunge into the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive him by faith. Would you open people's hearts today and save them and help them to find that rest in you? We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing this hymn, maybe new to you, The Power of the Cross. I think that the, the uh, melody is very singable and uh, will bless your heart. Let's stand and sing to the glory of God.
and Savior. Mm. Praise his name. Go forth now with the blessing of God and work out your own salvation in fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to do it of his good pleasure. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.